It's my um, pleasure to um, welcome back a friend of this support group and also of PCFA, Professor Warwick Del Prado. Warwick, if you could move slowly to the podium, we'll clap you as you come on. Um, wa Warwick um, is a pathologist extraordinaire. Um, he makes the pathology subject very understandable for us lay people. And he's, I don't know how many times he's addressed his support group, but it's quite a number. It's more than two or three. And uh, he also addresses a lot of prostate cancer related forums. And we're very grateful that he spends a bit of his time here tonight with us. So, Warwick, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I have given a version of this talk uh, previously. Uh, to groups like this. So for the people who have been here before, if any of you heard this talk before, um, it's different than it was last time, which is good. Um, but uh, if you go to a rock concert, you hear the same songs over and over again because they're really, really good. And you'll be hearing some of the same sort of things over and over again today. Um, the, um, what I'd like to do today is do some explanation and um, get a few definitions out of the way. Then there's going to be a little bit of boring bit in the middle with some facts, and then we're going to finish with some interactive type things. So you'll have to wake up towards the end at least, if nothing else. Um, I'm a histopathologist. Uh, I work for Douglas Henning Moore Pathology, as well as working at most of the larger private hospitals uh, around Sydney. Um, all I do is, is tissue pathology. Um, and I have a major interest in prostate pathology, which is, I suppose, why I'm here today. Um, pathologists are, um, are actually doctors. Uh, there's a lot of uh, complaints about uh, what a pathologist is these days, and I think this is the best way to illustrate it. We have obstetricians, paediatricians, anaesthetists, cardiologists. Um, <laughs> surgeons and pathologists. Um, and we get a bad rap. Uh, we get a bad rap because people don't see us very much because we're tucked away in offices. So that's one of the reasons I came out here to show you that we're real people. Um, and um, we get a sort of bloodsucker reputation as well. I'd like to stress I'm not actually in the blood department of the pathology department. I'm in the tissue department. Um, we look down microscopes and um, we make uh, diagnoses down the microscopes, which are not usually evident from other ways. Um, Recently, it's become very trendy to be involved in forensic pathology. Uh, that's really not what we do, and those people aren't really pathologists. Uh, the real ones you have to watch if you want to watch Silent Witness. But again, we tend not to rush all around the world solving crimes. We just stay in one spot and report pathology. Uh, and that's sort of what we're doing. We're actually looking to way to put numbers on things and names on things so that it's helpful for people, things that they wouldn't normally understand to make it easier for them to understand. So, which one's the one missing out? Well, it depends upon the perspective. But if we assume we're underwater, the guy in the middle at the bottom is out of, out of perspective, but other people, you know, depending if they're all flying, maybe not. It depends a lot on what's going on. It's an observation and analyzing the facts, the, the features of things. Finished files, the results of years of science stuff, scientific study, whoops, combined with the experience of many years. What does that mean? Well, actually not a lot, but what I want you to do is look at it and count the Fs in the sentence. You've got three seconds. Okay, now you have to put your hands up. Uh, there's no hiding for this one. Who saw that there were two Fs and only two Fs in that sentence? Who saw that there were three Fs and only three Fs in that sentence? Anyone see four Fs in the sentence? Anyone see five Fs? No, you. Anyone see five Fs in the sentence? Anyone see six Fs in the sentence? Anyone see seven Fs in the sentence? Okay, because there's a lot of information we have to process as things go on. And we look at the important things, and then we chuck out the things that aren't important. So after you've read the sentence, the ofs aren't really relevant, because your brain sort of worked all that out, and the actual analyzing the words are important. Um, so actually, there's six Fs in there. And really, what pathology is trying to do is look at all the information to present that so that you can have the maximum amount of information to understand if you're unwell, if you've got uh, unhealth problems, if you need medical treatment. It's about providing all that information and analyzing it and making it easier for the person to understand their process and for the doctors to help them. Okay, so know your pathologist. He, she, or it is human and has feelings. Um, we'll come back to our little fella on the right later on. But it is an important activity. It's a medical activity. And as I said previously, uh, my heart is in the um, prostate field. No one laughed. That's a bad sign. 
Okay, so pathology. Is pathology worth all the effort? What are we actually doing, apart from looking at Fs in sentences? What we're actually doing is generally working in the context of classifications of things. We're trying to find out a structure of things that allows different information to be transmitted. So it's not quite putting pigeons in pigeonholes, but it's partly that. This is one of the classifications of prostate cancer. There's actually not one prostate cancer. There's one that's the most common prostate cancer, but there are actually quite a different uh, range of variations. And then within those variations, there are different behaviors and there are different side effects. So really, my job is to look at those sort of things, to define those situations, and then to put that in a classification which allows the doctor and the patient to understand the disease process, to understand what treatment's necessary, to define the timing of treatment, which is particularly important, and to make planning for the whole situation of the patient and uh, of their disease process. So it's really about providing information. Okay, now I said there's gonna be a few definitions. Um, pathology is the science and study of cause of disease. It's a branch of medicine, we're all doctors. Um, but I like it better than so far as you think of it, it's actually a disorder. It's a disorder of the normal structure or function in a human pathology or animal. In other words, it's a deviation from the normal aspect. And if you're talking about deviation, then you've got to really know what normal is. And we spend a lot of time teaching our registrars, teaching our young pathologists uh, to recognise what normal pathology is and then what, what the abnormal processes are. You look at it from the point of view of the variation from normal. How widely does it divert from normal? If it's diverting for a long time from normal, then it's going to be a problem. And when you look down a microscope, you're looking primarily at appearance. You're looking at the size of cells, you're looking at the tissue that those cells are in, and you're looking at the way that they interact with each other. It's a sort of structural pattern recognition type stuff. If there's a little variation, in other words, the cells and the tissue in your body looks like it's supposed to, then we're talking about little effect and it's just a benign process. If, however, the tissue inside the body, for whatever reason, has deviated from its normal structure and its normal behaviour, then that's when you get a big effect, you get damage and destruction, and you get the word malignant put in that situation. So it's best to think of it in that sort of range of behaviour. Good tumours are tumours that look like they're supposed to, look like normal tissue. Bad tumours are ones that grow really quickly, and they're the ones that are quite different from normal tissue. And I'll come back to that and show you later on. Cancer is, by definition, something that is a new growth. Um, it's purposeless, it preys on the host, and for all intents and purposes, it is autonomous up to a point. Some cancers aren't, and prostate cancer, as you know, is one of those. It does respond to hormone therapy. It can be manipulated. So we can look at these quick steps, and these are the steps that define whether a cancer is a good cancer or a bad cancer. The differentiation is, as I said, how different is it from the normal tissue? If the circles are nice and regular and round like they're supposed to be, that's good. But if they're actually funny, wriggly, squarey things, that's actually a bad cancer. So this is a well-differentiated cancer. This is a poorly differentiated cancer, more like, say, you might in prostate talk about a low-grade or a high-grade cancer. If the cells are all piggledy-piggledy and all over themselves, again, that is something we looked at in the microscope to recognise as a feature of being a tumour that's a bad prognosis tumour. But more importantly, from the clinical point of view, from the patient's point of view, is how quickly is something growing? Is it growing really, really slowly? Is it gonna cause problems over a long period of time or is it gonna cause problems in a short period of time? Rapid growth is actually a feature of most types of carcinoma. And then if they grow rapidly, they run out of space where they started off and they spread to the surrounding tissue. And that's called local invasion, so that the cancer is this thing here in the middle and it's starting to distort the tissue which should have been this sort of a nice cylinder and has now become all puckered as the cancer actually destroys the surrounding tissue and that's called local invasion of the surrounding tissue structures. In the prostate, you'd be talking about seminal vesicles and bladder, the surrounding tissue organs. And then if a tumour really becomes nasty, it will spread from the location that it started from, not just as a slow-growing direct infiltrating process, but actually as a metastasis. It means that it's actually gone and left that part of the body and has spread to another part of the body. And they can do that by spreading in the blood supply, hematogenous spread, and there's actually a whole series of different pipes and plumbings in the body which are way too complicated to try and map um, tonight anyway. But these are called the lymphatic system and then there's some body cavities that again allow cancer cells to move around. So once a cancer cell's decided to wander, it can actually use these paths to spread and to metastasize. So we're trying to recognize that and define what's going on. Okay, so 
how do I fit into all that? How do I fit into that from the point of view of as a pathologist and as a doctor? Okay, now I said I was a histopathologist, which means I basically spend most of my time looking down a microscope at tissue. There are other pathologists who spend all their time in blood laboratories, uh, looking at machines who analyze all your blood and they come up with your biochemistry, your sodium and potassium and your PSA levels. And then there are microbiologists who are looking at organisms. And then there's a whole other group um, doing uh, clinical research and doing studies. And actually we all do a bit of that. Um, they're the three different aspects of what we tried to do in a pathology. Diagnostic, both in a tissue stage, clinical from the point of blood and organisms and things, and then clinical research. If you really try and isolate one of them from the other, it, um, it's not quite as interesting, and also you don't really get as far down the management path as you could. Okay, we'll come back to histopathology later on. This is the most common thing that you guys know about from the point of view of a clinical type of situation, and it's a report that includes um, PSA, and uh, some information about that. Now, I'm not an expert on PSA. You have to be really careful here. There's a whole bunch of other guys in the building that are experts in PSA. Um, but I can show you that I can actually use it to show all sorts of cool things. Um, but just a few comment comments about this. I talked before about a cancer is something that varies from normal. PSA is, again, something that varies from normal. It's actually a range of results for a population, the most important value is the individual's value and how that value changes in time rather than how you fit into the whole population. Your PSA is your own personal PSA. So there are variations in the PSA result. Just the normal person, it can vary hugely during the day. Um, it can vary slightly based upon the different ways you analyze it, but actually just normal walking and talking um, can cause your PSA to change. Prostate cancer is one way. Uh, benign hyperplasia, as you get a little bit older and your prostate swells, just benign way, uh, that can cause it. The most common thing actually is, the, um, is urinary tract infections and inflammations of the prostate. And that causes tissue damage and um, glands that are irritated. And so the PSA can come out from that point of view. Uh, bike riding is also another thing that can put your prostate up slightly over a long period of time if you um, don't have the right seat on your bike. But these days the bike seats are really quite good. Um, it's not affected by normal routine digital examination. It doesn't cause it to go up in any sort of acute way immediately. Okay, so this is how PSA in a normal population looks. It's fairly low, characterized by the green number. But over time, a PSA can be quite large in the gray thing just because of benign enlargement of the prostate. So the glands get bigger as we get all get a bit older, the muscle gets a bit bigger. That's in a range which is fairly low, but can be extremely high, and that's still benign. So it overlaps with the pattern of PSAs that you get in cancers as well. So just because you've got a value of 10 doesn't mean you have a benign or a malignant process. What you do is important is if it's changing from 10 to 15 to 20 over a period of time. So it's actually a whole series of overlapping graphs. You can try and break it down a little bit, and one of the things that we try and do these days is a free to total ratio. And if the free-to-total ratio is very low, then it tends to support that it's more cancer as opposed to a benign hypoplastic process. Free-to-total ratio and, as I said, the PSA velocity change over time are the two major aspects of PSA that relate to other than just the, the routine type number. So that's biochemistry of PSA. Now, the histopathology of PSA is much more interesting um, because when I look down a microscope, I'm looking at architecture and structure to get information. But these days, we have ways of actually tying little labels onto what I'm looking down the microscope to get us information about function as well. And these are called special studies or immunoperoxidase sustained. So if you had a biopsy of the prostate and it didn't come back immediately the following next day because the pathologist was doing special studies, this is what we're doing. We're actually looking at the function of the cells by the way you label them. So for example, you can decide whether if a tumor has PSA in it, whether it's a local disease or whether it's spread. So for example, in local disease, if the, pro the prostate and the bladder are very close, if you've got a tumour, a cancer, is it coming from the bladder or is it coming from the prostate? The actual PSA secretion of that tumour can tell you a lot of that information. So, for example, here's a prostate chip. It's come out part of a transurethral section. And there's actually two cancers in this scene. There's one here and there's another one here represented by these pink smudgy areas. And if you do a PSA stain, put a label for PSA on it, you can see that the one on this side is actually prostate cancer 
and the one on this side doesn't have any PSA. So brown is standing up for PSA in that situation. So this is bladder cancer and this is prostate cancer in the same patient, in the same area, using the PSA to differentiate it, the two of them. So PSA is actually a very good marker from that point of view. It's present in most prostate cancers and we can recognize it down the microscope. You can also use it if somebody presents with a tumor somewhere else in the body. Is this coming from a lung? Is it coming from a prostate? This is a patient who had a, a hip replacement and this is the bone here and the bone had fractured previously and there's actually a metal prosthesis in the middle here but there's all these funny areas and in those funny areas there's actually holes in the bone and in those holes we can use the stain to demonstrate this brown pattern again that there's PSA in those cells. So therefore this is prostate cancer that spread to bone. So it's actually a useful marker for defining that sort of thing, not just in blood, but also in tissue. It's a nature of the prostate glands and of the prostate cancer. Okay, so that's the first part of the prostate talk. From the point of view of definitions now, what does it all mean to you guys? Where does it fit together? How does it all relate together? And therefore, what is the information in the pathology report that matters? What am I up to that helps you have more information? Okay, the prostate itself, as you know, is a little triangular pyramidal structure that sits down towards the bottom of the bladder. And it's composed of muscles and glands, glands are little spaces that make the secretions, the PSA. And so therefore, it has this structure, which is like the infrastructure that surrounds the outside of something, like the concrete, the ground. And then it has these little lining areas here, which are the glands, the spaces that are making the PSA. And there are a whole bunch of different cells, and we look at those cells and we analyze them and then based upon the deviation, as I said, you can come up with the classification of tumours that are occurring. This one's a slightly longer and more fuller version of what I said before. But basically, if you've got a normal gland and the, the glands are looking much like the, the structure in the normal prostate in the cancer, then it's a good tumour and if they're looking very different, it's a bad tumour. Let me show you what I mean. In a little gland, this is a prostate cancer, in fact it's two prostate cancers. Here we have nice little round, reasonably regular circle, some of them a bit irregular, um, but that's a well differentiated carcinoma. And in prostate terminology we talk about it as a low grade cancer, one that's not really going to grow very fast because it has these nice big regular spaces. Whereas this one is a high grade carcinoma and it's characterized by the loss of these nice regular spaces and all this purple stuff. So pink is the muscle, all this purpley bluey stuff is actually the cancer cells growing in that stroma and they're in a disorganized manner, they're growing in a higgledy-piggledy sort of manner and they're not making the normal structure. So this is low-grade cancer, this is high-grade cancer. That's important because there will be questions later on. Okay, now as I said the prostate had some structure in it, it's got some different lobes that wrap around each other and although we can describe them it's better to actually look at it in a diagram from different points of view. This is the best diagram to look at over here, you're looking at the prostate in that situation from the top. This is the front anteriorly here, the pelvis, this is the rectum out here, and it's got this posterior portion of the prostate which comes around called the peripheral zone, and then in the middle part here, there's the transitional zone. They do different things, and they cause different problems in your clinical situation, anybody's clinical situation. This is a slice through a prostate. Looking down a microscope, four pieces of prostate orientated and stained. That's the outside of the prostate running around there. This is urethra in the middle, coming down from the bladder and heading into the outside world. And these are the normal glands, little spaces that I talked about, the holes in the prostate where the, the actual glands are making the PSA. Notice that there's a space here where we've lost these little spaces. In other words, this spongy cystic space has been replaced by now solid stuff. And that's an area of cancer in that posterior peripheral zone. You can see it replacing the tissue and damaging the tissue. So depending on which part of the prostate you're trying to get to, is we have to use different sampling techniques and then the different parts of the prostate have different diseases processes in them. So the central and transitional zones are mainly the processes where you see benign conditions and the peripheral zone, which is a bit at the back, is mainly the position where you see cancer. There's no 100% rule, but that's why you do different types of procedures and different investigations and I'll show you the investigations in a moment. Okay, so that's some definitions. What does it all mean from the clinical point of view, from the manipulation of the specimens when they come to me, the pieces of tissue that come to me? And the other thing I'm going to spend a whole bit of time talking about too is Mr. Gleason. Uh, Donald Gleason is a 
pathologist from America. Um, he died, unfortunately, just recently. Um, he came up with the Gleason grading system, which is famous in pathology, and I'm sure you've all heard about it, um, back originally in the 1970s. Uh, and years ago, I saw him at a pathology meeting, and he was sort of wheeled out in a very um, debilitated state. And it was able to say enough to get the message across that I really can't believe you're still using my classification system before they wheeled him offside again. Um, but he was a very clever man. Um, and he came up with this numbering system, which we'll go through. OK, specimens, and then a bit more time on the Gleason grading, and a little bit of stuff in the middle about what's happening. OK, if you're going to get material from a prostate, there are four major ways of doing it. Prostate chips is the transurethral resection of prostate, which urologists do when people have obstruction to the outflow of the urine from their bladder, because the prostate gets large benign, in benign swelling over time, and it needs to be chipped away. Suprapubic prostatectomy is another way of doing the same procedure, and this is fairly rare these days. Core needle biopsy is the game changer in the late 80s that allowed us to get material from the back of the prostate, where the cancer is most likely to occur, that gives you the most of the diagnosis for cancers. And that's why you have transurethral resection, uh, transrectal biopsies of prostates and sometimes transperineals. It was the invention of this core biopsy that really changed the way we understand pathology and allowed us to learn a whole bunch of extra information about what goes on. Radical prostatectomy is the other type of specimen that I get. Not the only way you can be treated for prostate cancer, of course, but it's the main piece of tissue that I see as it comes across the deck. Um, we get quite a lot of them. Um, and this is what we are doing. This is my old office before we rebuilt the new building. Um, we have the microscope and a pile of slides, those little grass, grass, those little, whoops, those little plastic trays there are these things. And each one of these little slots is actually a glass slide with a piece of tissue on it that's been prepared from somebody's biopsy of their prostate. So what I have to do during the day is look at those bits of tissue and see if there's cancer in them. These are the sorts of bits of tissues that you get from a transurethral resection of prostate. They're much bigger and chunkier because they've been sort of scooped out. And then this is the sort of the large piece of tissue that you get from a radical prostatectomy. Okay, now the first quiz, the important thing. If this was my office, what is the most important thing in that picture? Yeah, the microscope's really quite important. Uh, we have the computers. The actual telephone's really important because I do a lot of communicating with people, a lot of talking, a lot of chatting. But actually the most important thing is that there's a lot of slides here and the coffee cup's really important. Um, it really is quite critical. I've got a whole collection of coffee cups. It can't survive without the coffee cup. Okay. Transurethral resection is very good at getting that transitional zone, which has the benign stuff in it, but occasionally has cancer hidden away. And it's the most common place for getting surprises when people have radical prostatectomies because it's actually an anterior cancer that wasn't picked up on the needle. Needle biopsies are actually very good at sampling the peripheral zone, and that's where most of the carcinomas are. So we'll go through each one of them. Transurethral resection, it's primarily done for the treatment of lower urinary tract symptoms, LUTs, obstruction, having trouble passing urine. And it does sample that middle part of the prostate around where the urethra, but it doesn't sample the back of the end of the prostate very well. When we report it, we talk about whether there's cancer there present, and we say whether their chips are involved a little bit or a lot based upon a percentage involvement, and we talk about the carcinoma, the grade of the cancer, those spaces we talked about before, and then whether there's actually other things going on, actually actual spread of the tumour into different places that it shouldn't be. We'll come back to what perineural and vascular invasion means. But that's the sort of information that you would get in a report for a, for a transurethral resection of prostate. Uh, for a needle biopsy, the needle biopsy um, situation is changing over the years. Uh, it started off with only about six biopsies being taken. These days we can get uh, little pots containing bits of tissue and we can get up to 14 or occasionally 20 little pots. And each one of those pots can have two or three core biopsies in them. Um, as the urologists have gotten much better at using ultrasounds and targeting systems to analyze the prostate, to find areas that are abnormal and to biopsy them in a, ma in a targeted sort of way, we're actually getting a lot more material from, from those. Uh, so the general rule, however, is to sample the right and left of the prostate and to sample the base, which is the top part, the middle part, and the apex, which is the bottom. Now, why is that round the wrong way? It is, isn't it? Because the base is the top and the apex is the bottom. But it's actually because the prostate's sort of like an inverted pyramid. And so the flat part sits up against the prostate, and then the little triangular bit comes down towards the urethra. So it's just named that way because it's the base of the bladder. Okay, 
if you're having one of these targeted biopsies, what we really want to do within that is come up with a prediction of what's actually going on in the body. Okay, don't forget, we're just sampling. So we're just taking a few little biopsies and looking at the overall tissue. So therefore, we'll give you a prediction of whether we think that there's a little bit of cancer or a lot of cancer and how that cancer is going to behave. Whether there's carcinoma present, the Gleason grade, and then of course the number and percentages of cores, and then whether there's any spread that's identifiable in those things. Okay, the other major one is the, trans, is the radical prostatectomy. The radical prostatectomy, when it's removed, is actually a large sort of chunky pink thing. Um, and then when we get it, we paint it blue. So no, there isn't a royal wedding connection here or anything like that with blue blood, whatever. What we do is we paint it blue so that we can actually define the outside of it. Uh, and it gives us a, a definition of where, how much of the material that the surgeon's taken out. We can say exactly at what point he, he finished taking it out. And then we slice it into different pieces so that you get little tops and the bottoms analyzed as slices. And then you get these large, like a bread or a sausage, taken up into loaves and each one of those removed. And then of course those loaves are often fairly large, so we break them up into smaller bits and they become little manageable pieces of material that we put underneath the microscope and I can look at and I can analyze them and describe them and give you all sorts of information. Because these are the, the important thing about the, the piece of tissue is the reason it's examined is because it gives you prognostic information. It gives you indications of how the cancer is going to go and what's going to become a part of the um, behavior of the cancer. So we, we could talk about the extent of the tumor or the volume of the tumor that's in the prostate, the amount of cancer that's there. We talk about the Gleason score and then we talk about whether there's any spread. So has the cancer gone outside the prostate? Has it involved other parts of the prostate? Has it involved the edges where the surgeon operated? Has it spread into the surrounding tissue, the seminal vesicles, or has it spread into the lymph nodes? Has it gone away from the prostate into the surrounding tissue? And of course, there's actually a lot of material taken at prostates as well for research uh, these days. Those bits of information all add up to an individual prognosis. Each person's prostate is different, each person's cancer is different, and all that sort of collection of information gives you an idea of how your particular cancer is going to behave over time. And that's what we really want to get. So we have the prostate in the cancer, we have the cancer in the prostate, we have the cancer in the prostate. If it's going to get out, it's going to get out in a number of ways. And what we want to do is look really carefully to see if that's happened. So, for example, the prostate has a bit of a capsule around it, has it stayed inside the capsule or has it gotten outside the capsule? If it's inside the capsule, then it's still probably localized. If it's not, then it has the chance to spread more aggressively. So this is cancer here, and this is the fat around the prostate, and the cancer's coming out and infiltrating into the prostate here. And the same thing, this is cancer here, and it's following the tissue down around here and starting infiltrating into the fat. So that's cancer that's gotten outside the prostate into the surrounding tissue. Now these are old figures because no, nobody has basic figures anymore because everyone's treated. But if you didn't do anything, the chances of just having nothing but capsular penetration at five and 10 years is that if you've got organ confined disease, in other words, no extra prosthetic extension, the chances of having any cancer that's spread are quite low at a later time. Whereas if you've got quite a lot of cancer outside the prostate, then the chances of that cancer coming back are increased. So that's why you get treatment after you have your radical prostatectomy if that happens. If the cancer gets out of the prostate and it's in the surrounding tissue, then it's harder for the surgeon to get around it. He's trying to operate, he's trying to make sure that he gets all as much of the cancer out as he can. And of course, there's lots of nerves in that part of the position they're trying to protect. They want to make sure they don't do any damage. And so they're trying to operate on a very fine line between getting all the cancer but not getting out too much into the surrounding tissue. This is what a negative resection margin looks like. This is the cancer here. The prostate finishes about there. And then this is more cancer in here out in the surrounding tissue. And then here we have fat. And as I said, we painted it bluey, blacky, whatever. This is the edge of the prostate out here from the point of view of the operation. So this cancer is stopped. There's lots of tissue between that. That is a cancer that shows extra prostatic extension spread outside the prostate, but in which the resection margins are quite nicely negative. This, however, is a cancer here where the cancer started to spread beyond the edge of the prostate, which is the capsule running along there. This is cancer out here, and it's still going. This is the surgeon's resection margin, and so this is a positive margin. So this is carcinoma showing extra prostatic extension with a positive margin. We know for sure that there is cancer in the space somewhere out here. So that cancer has a high risk of coming back over a period of time. So if you've got local disease confined to the prostate, that's good, and sometimes that represents a cure. There's a lot of other factors involved. There's Gleason grade and a whole bunch of other things, but that does mean that you have a better prognosis tumor, whereas if you've got a margin involvement, 
then you're more likely over time to get a recurrence of that tumour and to have an earlier rising PSA because there's a cancer developing in that tissue. How does the cancer get out? It does follow little tracks, it follows motorways, it follows paths, it follows tubes and pipes, it's quite cunning. The main way it does is perineural, which is to follow the nerves. So your prostate has lots of nerves coming into it, and as they come in through the capsule, there's little spaces around those nerves. And cancer has a habit of growing down around those nerves. This is the edge of the prostate muscle here. This is a big nerve coming out here. And just around the edges of it, you can see that there's actually cancer growing itself down here around this nerve and then exiting the prostate that way. It's just followed the gap of the nerve as it runs along. And the surgeon's trying to operate around the outside of the nerve here and not damage too much of the nerve, but in this case, the cancer's following the nerve and spreading along it. And so there it is, actually outside the prostate now, little bits of cancer around those outside of nerves. So that's one of the tracks that it follows. The other one that it follows is, of course, we have lots of little pipes that allow fluid and blood to move around our body, and they also cause go in and out of the prostate gland. And this is called intravascular invasion when the cancer and this is benign down here, and this is the cancer. Notice the big glandular spaces here, and then the more disorganized cancer up here. The cancer comes down and gets into a vessel, in one of these pipes inside the prostate, and then it can use that pipe to grow along quickly. There's nothing to obstruct it when it's growing along in that. And so this is cancer now down here, and then there's got cancer in these vascular spaces spreading, heading outside the prostate. So it follows the tubes, or it follows little nerves to get out. Or it can follow out the, the drown, draining. It can follow out the draining glands, and when it does that, it follows the seminal vesicles. Now, the seminal vesicles are glands that sit on top of the prostate, and they make lots of secretions. But of course, they dip into the prostate. They damage, or they don't damage, but they uh, come in through the capsule, and that makes a hole in the capsule where they come in, which is normal. But the cancer can get into that space, and it can come up inside the seminal vesicle. This is the edge of the seminal vesicle here. This is the lumen. The, the middle part where it's making its secretions and all these little dotty things in here is actually cancer and it's growing up in amongst that muscle saying yes this is a great way I can get outside the prostate here I can grow along in these spaces I can grow along in these little vascular spaces there's the normal and I can grow along underneath that so it follows a series of tracks and you get quite large areas this is normal over here and this is the cancer these big spaces over there once it gets out the potential is that it can spread and the most common place that it goes to is what's referred to as the lymph nodes in the body, which are actually sort of like a, a collection of filters that drain any fluid that's running around the body, and they're great for fighting infection and everything. But because they're little filters, cancer cells tend to get stuck in them, at least for some period of time. And so we can recognize that. Lymph nodes, when you look around on the microscope, are full of all these little lymphoid cells, but sometimes you see these little glandular spaces here. And this is cancer that has spread from the prostate in the other sections, wandered down across the space here and now is starting to grow within those lymph nodes. So sometimes the surgeon will try and get ahead of that and they'll remove the lymph nodes at the time of the radical prostatectomy. Uh, sometimes after radical prostatectomy they'll need to go back and to put radiotherapy onto the, uh, the lymph nodes to destroy these cells, that are, these glands that are not supposed to be in that location. They're causing damage to the tissue and they're going to spread from beyond that. Okay, so that's all the sort of information. Now, to bring you up to date with what's happening in my little part of the world and how we're presenting that information, has the information changed over a period of time what we're doing, and as I said, I keep promising we'll be spending a little bit more time on Gleason grading. The big push at the moment is to have standardised reporting. Um, Douglas Henny Moy has been ahead of this for quite a while insofar as we have a structured report that has a whole series of layers in it uh, with information fitting into those particular layers and then we also give you a graphic representation of what's going on. Uh, the College of Pathologists and the uh, Department of Health is moving really rapidly at the moment towards standardised reporting in just about everything in prostate. And the long-term goal of this is the e-health record. Uh, is that information from a pathology report will be able to be downloaded into a patient's individual e-health record and that will be available to anybody at any time. Uh, this is only in its early days. As in the last three or four years, we've got uh, now standardised reporting systems for about eight different types of cancer in the system which everybody uses. Prostate was actually one of the first because it was well worked up. Um, but eventually it will come along for everybody else. Uh, there's new research in uh, markers too, which I'll come back to in two seconds. But looking at the synoptic reporting, 
whole bunches of people have gotten together with urologists and whatever and spent a lot of time looking at biopsies and radical prostatectomies to come up with standardized terminology and standardized criteria so that no matter what happens, you know what the words in your pathology report means and you can talk it over with your urologist, your oncologist, whatever, and everybody knows they're working in the right sort of ballpark. For radical prostatectomies, it's basically the particular way the Gleason score is presented, the tumor extent and location, whether the, the cancer is outside the prostate, the margin status, the seminal vesicle lymphatics, basically all those things that I've talked about before, they're the most important factors and they're in a particular new structure of report. And then the reports will increasingly have this sort of representation in it where you can define and draw where the cancer is in the prostate so that if a urologist or an oncologist has to go back and give radiotherapy, they know exactly that it was the top left-hand corner over here that the cancer had a positive margin and had gotten outside the prostate. So we can draw these sort of really, really rough diagrams. It's not art. Um, I'm not very good on art. But we can actually do little representations of where the cancer is and map it actually quite nicely. So that sort of information, I thought I'd just actually show you the real world of how that information is, um, is affecting us um, and show you quickly just a part of the Douglas Honey Moy database on radical prostatectomies. Uh, we do quite a lot of radical prostatectomies. Last year, the practice reported on about 12, 1,300 radical prostatectomies over the year. Um, so it does take up a fair amount of my time. Um, and I've still got to do it the last couple of years, but we have gone back and looked at the different um, results in those sort of pathology things. So this is actually just looking at the changes over time from about the mid-1994, 1995, right up to 2008. And these are averages, okay, so it's not a big sweep. Um, but the ages has been roughly the same. The main number of prostate cancers patients that we see operated on are in their 60s, mid-60s, but we do have patients down around the 50s. We've had a couple in their 30s nowadays. Um, and of course, we do, they tend not to operate on the really, really old patients. Um, they have different types of therapy. But the average is, hasn't really changed very much over time. Uh, the prostate really hasn't changed as an organ over time. The weights of it have been much the same. There has been a big change in the way we analyze prostates and the way we report things. And Gleason score has changed over time. And these days, people tend to have a slightly higher number in their Gleason score than they might have in the past because we understand the numbering system a little bit more than Donald Gleason. Donald Gleason worked on series, and when he published it, of about 1,200 cases, then he updated it to nearly 2,000 cases. These days, some of the big units in America are churning out papers every six months based upon another 1,000 cases. So our criteria have actually been improved and have changed. And I was part of a study uh, group in 2005 that modified the Gleason grading system, which is now the current one that we use, the modified Gleason grading, which is why the Gleason grade has been moving up over time, because we're including some more of the higher numbers. I'll show you what the numbers mean in a moment. Extra prostatic extension. There was something going on a little bit worse in the old days. These are, these are the ones where there's no extra prostatic extension, this is where there's a little bit, and this is where there's a lot. And um, it seems to have gotten stabilized now that around about 25% of prostate cancers, just on average, have got extra prostatic extension, and the others don't. Uh, these are the ones where there's no extra prostatic extension, and that seems to be a, fl a flattened out. Um, there were maybe more advanced cancers in the old days, but now we're doing much more investigation and aggressive treatment. Um, margin status has changed a lot over the time, um, and this is primarily because of surgeon expertise and new technologies, including robots and a whole bunch of other different things, um, although the robots cause the opposite for a short period of time. But this is the negative surgical resection margin. Um, so what is it up to? It's sort of seven, I can't see the thing, because it's thing, 70%. Um, over time, just a little focal extra, a little focal margin has decreased dramatically. And so we're left now with this group of patients here that hasn't really changed much where they've got a lot of spread outside um, and they get positive margins no matter what happens. Uh, and that again seems to have stabilized now and the graph going forward is much the same. So the people are, people are being operated on now um, have a much better chance of having negative margins than they did 10, 15 years ago. Uh, seminal vesicle involvement hasn't really changed. It's pretty much stable. And the other thing that happens, and even though there's a bit of a huge fluctuation in this graph, the actual numbers here are really small. And this is lymph node in metastasis. So in the point of view of a radical prostatectomy, we don't actually see many lymph nodes that have got cancer in them that have spread because if there's obvious cancer in the lymph nodes, the surgeons don't do the operation. So those are the trends over time. Um, better results, more information, better understanding of what's going on. That's really the things that are going on. 
Okay, now from the point of view of is there anything new that's going on that's really making a difference apart from just the way we move the numbers around? Yes, there's a lot of research stuff going on and the Prostate Cancer Foundation has been critical in a lot of this happening. Um, that over the last particularly 10 years, there's been a whole bunch of uh, information about molecular, uh, molecular biology. When I look at a tissue structure, I'm looking at the architecture and the structure. If you look beyond that and you're going right down to the, the actual anatomy, to do the actual atoms, the actual molecules, then there's a whole bunch of different things that's going on at genetic level that we haven't understood before and we're only just now becoming understanding. Breast pathology was worked out, this, a lot of this stuff was worked out sort of 15 years ago. Prostate pathology, we're only now just getting up to, um, to speed with it. Some of these are useful and some of them are not so useful. Um, Temperus is a genetic abnormality that appears to be a marker of poor prognosis in prostate cancers. If you have this genetic change, then it's related to your androgen receptors, your hormone receptors, and your genes all get stuck together in an unusual sort of way, and it's called a fusion expression. But what we know from this particular genetic abnormality is that it is associated with these types of features that I see down the microscope that are a bad prognostic feature. So it looks like that a temperous genetic abnormality, if it's present, means the patient's more likely to have a higher grade carcinoma. Still very controversial, this stuff is only a few years old, um, but it, is, um, it looks like it might be one of the markers we can use. Another really useful marker, which is a lot of research going on to at the moment, is actually zinc. Um, and there's a protein that has a lot of zinc in it called AZ AZGP1. Uh, which circulates in the body and is present in um, prostatic glandular epithelium in the cells that make up your um, prostate. And so if you can see them as a brown stain, uh, then you're recognizing that those cells haven't changed much from their normal abnormality. Whereas if it's lost, so the dark brown is normal, the light brown is smudgy and the cells have gone away, and here this is a benign gland and that's cancer, then that seems to indicate also a higher prognostic tumor. Now the trouble with these sort of little markers is that they don't give us that much more information than we're currently getting out of just basic pathology and the Gleason grade and the Gleason score. Um, so they're not the answer yet, but we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. And so if you break it up, you can see that if you've got AZGP expression, then you do a much better prognosis than if you have no AZGP, and then sometimes the patients uh, uh, have a recurrent disease more quickly. This is all really, really incredible early research at the moment, um, and there are papers just starting to be generated about it, but there is more information coming because people are looking harder and they've now got this, the, uh, the tools to look harder. Some things, however, are around and they're not much use. Um, PCA3 is a thing that is available as a marker, um, and it's actually taken uh, on a protein in the urine and then analyzing that and comparing that with the normal PSA. Um, and you come up with a band score, uh, and it's a number. The trouble with, um, and I'm going to get in trouble for about saying this, the trouble with oncology is that oncologists as a group tend to like numbers and they do to like the considered opinion of pathologists. Um, and they go, oh look, this gives me a number, I can treat the number. And I say, but it's not as actually as accurate as me giving you a whole bunch of factors and sitting around a table and saying this is good or this is bad. Um, so PCA3 is something that's very unproven at the moment, but is around in the marketplace. Um, but it's all part of the representation of getting more information and getting, um, getting as much information as we can. Okay, so Donald Gleason. Why do we spend so much time going on and on about Donald Gleason? Well, Donald Gleason was really, really clever and he worked out that prostate cancer is a bit different from most other types of cancers. In most other cancers, it's the worst area that matters and that's the bit that's going to cause the most problem. Whereas in prostate cancer, there's a bit of averaging goes on. Now we know it's not as averaging as he thought it was. And he came up with this grading system and so we've had to modify it over the last few years because I say we have more information. But basically, if you look at things that are going on in the whole prostate, you can draw bits of information from those to give you an idea of what might happen about this cancer. So what we have is a relatively simple system but wrapped up in lots and lots of complexity. And we use these different expressions like we use Gleason grades and we use Gleason score. Okay, so what it is actually is pattern recognition. Now, look at the different patterns. How much does it vary from normal? Is it like what it's supposed to look like or is it not what like it's supposed to look like? And therefore, how is it gonna behave? Okay, now, everybody knows about inkblot tests. Pattern recognition, recognizing things that are going on. Well, we have similar sort of things in prostates. So, this is the first part of the test. I'm going to give you a little test and you have to do pattern recognition. <laughs> now you saw him before. What is he? 
Anyone got an idea what he is apart from a happy little face? I think he's an Australian prostate cancer because he looks like a koala. And actually, this is a benign gland and these are secretions within the lumen of the gland but they give you a pattern that you can look at when you look down the microscope. Okay, that's one pattern. This is another pattern that you see when you look down and I've showed you this already before because I said my heart was in the work that I was doing. So hopefully you can all see it now and you'll all laugh hysterically. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, very much. Um, these sort of shapes are important and critical. And you see all sorts of different types of shapes and you can give them different sort of colours of the heart. I'm big on hearts. Yeah. I used to do lots of heart pathology. Okay, move on from the hearts. What's this one? It's a smiley face. It's a smiley face. Okay, this is a prostate core. These are some benign glands. This is a gland here and there are some secretions in the middle. My son says I'm deeply disturbed, by the way. <laughs> he says I should have a blog on all this sort of stuff. It's, it's really, really sad. He's in advertising. He thinks I'm really sad. Okay, what's the next one? It's another face. This one's trying to smile, but he's got a bit of indigestion, a bit of sinusitis, I think, and his nose is a bit swollen up and that sort of stuff, and he really needs a new haircut. But you can see smiley face there, I think, as well. Okay, the next one, we're going to move away from the faces. What pattern do you recognise here? Australia. It's Australia, yeah, see, isn't that great? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> What's the duck doing for bonus points? Very close. I like to think of it that he's laying the golden egg, but if you want to say he's pooing, I'll give you bonus points for that as well. Okay, yes. But you see, he's got a little face. These are not touched up. These are just sections from prostate. You look down the microscope, you see sorts of strange things. Okay, now this one's really, really difficult. This one is, I'll also give you a hint, it's seasonal. It's a reindeer. Very good. I put it on some of the Christmas cards I used this year. Um, <laughs> he's got antlers, only to a couple of surgeons, it's all right. Um, he's got antlers and all sorts of things. So when you look down the microscope, you can see these patterns. And if you're disturbed like me, you can actually recognize things. If you're not disturbed, but you can actually take that information and take it back to the cancer and recognize things that are going on, then you can come up with information from the patient other than just you've got a reindeer in your prostate. This was untouched up, by the way. This was just on a needle biopsy that was sent to me. Um, and I rang him up and I said, this guy's got reindeers. And he went, <laughs> what? Go away, Warwick. Okay. So how does that help with the Gleason? Well, Gleason is about pattern recognition, okay? It's about looking down and seeing this shape, what does it mean, how does it fit in in context of what it's supposed to fit into, okay? This is Donald Gleason's original diagram of the different types of patterns, and he had five different patterns, and he broke them up into some different levels. This is the 2006 modification that a whole bunch of us were involved in and has now been accepted internationally as the modification of Gleason's. And it basically made it a little bit neater and cleaner and took out a lot of the fluffy overlap. And there was a few conditions that were in Donald Gleason's original classification which he didn't know they were a particular type of cancer or a particular something or other and we've been able to move them around. But what he worked out was that if you take the prostate and you look at it and you define these different patterns, if you look at the two biggest or now the two dominant or the two highest grade different patterns, they give you a number which gives you an idea of how the average cancer is going to behave in that particular patient. So what you can do is say that if it's just a nice little round bit, you might give it a number of one and up here you might give it a number of two, a number of five. So the Gleason grade Gleason grade, in other words, the pattern of the glands is one to five. But because when we're looking at this, we're trying to find the overall pattern, we look at the several different areas and we put some of those numbers together and you add them up to give you the Gleason score. So the Gleason grade can go from one to five. You take two areas, you add the two Gleason grades from those two areas together and you come up with a sum which goes from two to ten. Two is the lowest number that's possible, ten is the highest number that's possible. And then, if you look at those patients, you can find that they can be grouped. So the two to five people with Gleason grades, two to five are the people who have got prostate cancer that is there until they're run over by a bus. It's not going to do anything to them. Um, and a lot of old males have prostate cancer in small volumes in the Gleason score 2.5. Six, seven, and then eight to 10 are the different groupings and the chances of recurrence of the cancer and spread of the cancer goes up 
as the number goes down. Now we've broken it down and we've mixed up the numbers and the numbers are actually much more complicated than that. But what we do is actually we put them together to give a sum. So when you look at your pathology report, you'll see that your pathology report will have a Gleason score 3 plus 4 equals 7. That's not just, not just because your pathologist is an idiot and can't add up and he has to write out the whole sum like that. No, it's important because the first number is the highest grade, is the, is the grade that's most common, it's the highest number. The second number is the highest area of cancer and the highest number in the cancer and then the score is the number that you get at the end of it. So 3 plus 4 equals 7 is actually different from 4 plus 3 equals 7. It makes important what the order of them is because the first number is usually the biggest amount of cancer that's there. So let's just quickly go through them and then we're going to have a little test. Everything varies from normal. The prostate consists of all that, that structure that I talked about before and little round glands. Little round glands are good, not little round glands are bad. So a Gleason grade one is characterized by a nice little round nodule of these little sponge-like vacuolar spaces. A Gleason grade two is characterized by these little spaces but just starting to separate from each other. They're still nice and round and regular and joined up here, but some of them are a little bit messy around the edges. It's not quite a nice little hard ball as it was before. It's like a little balloon that's sort of blown up a bit and they've started to get a bit separated. That's Gleason grade two. Gleason grade three is where you lose that nice little rounded nature of the little glandular spaces and little glandular spaces are now starting to wander and so they're doing their own thing. So in one and two they're hanging together, they're doing a sort of very slow thing with each other. In grade three these little spaces start to wander off and they wander between the benign stuff. So this is benign gland here and all these little round spaces here are grade three glands, still nice little round glands, sometimes a little bit irregular, but still round little glands, but they're wandering. They're no longer in a rounded mess, they're now starting to spread. If the cancer moving down the spectrum from low grade to high grade has stopped hanging out as those nice little round glandular structures, but is now starting to form an irregular series of sponges. So maybe if you imagine a sponge and then you squash it together so all the holes start to overlap from each other, then that's Gleason grade four. So now you can't really see nice little neat round holes in any one of these spaces. The holes sort of all blur and they join up together. And that's called a cribriform or anastomosing or joining together pattern. And that's characteristic of Gleason grade four. So Gleason grade one starts off with nice little round spaces. Gleason grade four, by the time you get to grade four, the spaces are starting to bump up against each other. And of course, by definition, when you get to grade five, there are no spaces anymore. So now we've just got cancer cells these are cancer cells and it is growing and destroying the tissue. There are a few other unique patterns which are in that category as well, but for all intents and purposes, the spread of individual cells where there are none of those round spaces characterized is grade five cancer. Okay, that's exhausting and makes no sense. <sighs> lots of numbers and lots of patterns. Okay, the only way to do it, there's a basic principle in medicine, which is see one, do one, teach one. And it works really, really well, so in the next two and a half minutes or three minutes, you're all going to become Gleason grade experts. And you've got to go away with your little certificate. No, I'm not going to give out certificates, sorry. <laughs> it's all about glory, this one. Um, I'm going to show you 10 cases. People have had needle biopsies of prostates and you're going to grade them. And at the end of it, you'll be experts in Gleason grading. You might be exhausted, but you'll be okay. Okay, this is the first one. I will explain them to you because it's all lots of dots on the screen. I'm aware of that, don't worry. Patient's got a Gleason score. This is part of his prostate. These big gaps in the middle are blood vessels, so they're normal. The rest of it's cancer. All these little round things here are actually cancer. The pink stuff in the background, ignore it. That's the stroma, that's the architecture, that's the concrete, that's the infrastructure. It's these roundular spaces, the problem. Now, if you look over here, see how they're big and they're reasonably round and they've got holes in the middle of them. So they're still reasonably discrete glandular spaces. And over here you've got little dots, but the dots and the round spaces are in a much more higgledy-piggledy disorganized pattern. And you don't have the nice, neat spaces that you've got here. But you've still got some spaces. So you could say that this is grade three. This is grade four carcinoma. There's a bit more of this than the other. So you could say this would be Gleason's score, three plus four equals seven. It's a simple sum. 
Okay, that's the first one, but I helped you. <laughs> okay. Now, there is a trick. The next case is the trick. Sometimes there's only one pattern there. If there's only one pattern, then you have to come up with a number that equals 10. You can't have a number that comes to 5, so you just double it. So if you've got an area like this, and this is benign, and this is benign, and this is cancer here in the middle, and these are all pretty much the same. They're all nice, reasonably round spaces. There's only one of them. So you give that a grade number between 1 to 5, and then you just double it to give you a x plus x equals whatever. So what's this Gleason score? Uh, it's 3 plus 3 equals 6. You're allowed a little bit of coming together, and the photographs could be a little bit higher power, but that's okay. I can't let you get it all right because I wouldn't have a job. Um, but yeah, a little bit of bl bl fluffiness around the outside was one of the big things that we had the big fight in 2005 about what represents Gleason 3 and Gleason Grade 4. Okay, case number three. This is two core bar This is one core biopsy just represented two photographs. There are two areas. There's one area here, there, and there's the other area here. Both are cancer. There is this pale stuff around here, but there aren't nice little neat round holes. It's just sort of a coming and going, sort of mixed, some little anastomosing thing. And then down here, you really don't have any little spaces at all. So what's that? Yeah. Depending which photograph you're looking at, it's either 4 plus 5 or 5 plus 4. In this photograph, this one actually looks a bit bigger, and I've made it a thing. So that's actually 5 plus 4. There's a bit more of it over here, so it's 4 plus 5. It depends upon the pattern. Each one's correct. It's at least in score 9 in that situation. But yeah, very good. So grade 4, grade 5, carcinoma. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, case number 4. This is a bit of benign stuff over here. There's something going on down here, and it's different from what's going on up here. This one's got some holes in it. This one has got this cribriformy sort of pattern. Uh, there's, these have got spaces, so this is three. These are chunkier bits, though. They're not individual cells. It's still grade four. Okay, so if it's still forming glandular spaces, even if they're really badly formed, this is grade four, and this is grade three. So that's Gleason score of 4 plus 3 equals 7. Okay, this one's easy. I showed it to you. It's a rounded area with tumor cells in it, a little bit of spread around the edge. Again, another rounded area of cancer cells here, a little bit of movement out of the outside, but still basically that circumscribed area. So it's 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is the muscle, the stroma, this cancer here, this cancer here. There are glandular spaces down here, discrete little structures you can define here, and it gets lost when you come over here. So you've got that as a dominant pattern and that as a secondary pattern. Three plus four, Three plus four equals seven. Very good, very good. Two different pictures, same patient. This is a solid mass of cancer, still forming some poorly formed glandular structures. And again, here you can see little dots and clear spaces in amongst it. But it's not really forming any of those round spaces, but it is forming a massive gland, a massive tissue. So it's not individual cell infiltration pattern yet, so it's not five, but it's not still forming glandular spaces, so it's not three. It's really only one pattern, even though it's two different pictures of the same pattern. So you can call that. 4 plus 4 equals 8. You guys are flying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. There's only glory. One area here, other area here. This is low power, but if you look at it low power, you can see it looks a bit like a sponge. It's got spaces. There's no sponge artifact. There's no sponge effect here. So therefore, that's uh, uh, uh. so it's 4 plus 5 equals 9. Or actually, if you take this picture, this is actually a higher power shot, not as volume, but if you wanted to take it on pure volumes, you could say 5 plus 4 equals 9. Okay, last two. This is nothing, it's benign over here. This is the cancer pretty much in here. It's round little spaces 
with holes in a half a heart. Now it's 3 plus 3 equals 6. These are still reasonably discrete glands. A little bit of an argument about what's going on just there in the photograph. Okay, last one. It's a really hard one. And the reason I put this one here is to show you because sometimes the cells can really, really grow really, really rapidly. When they grow really, really rapidly, they die off because they're not getting enough blood supply. So this is actually a big mass of cribriforming cancer, the nastomosing glandular cancer there. Um, there's actually a bit of necrosis in the middle where the tumor is actually growing so quickly. It's actually dying. There's some more of this cribriforming stuff here, but in the background, there's all these little purple dots. These are individual cancer cells and these large anastomosing areas. So that's equal to, that's a nine. Very good. So it's Gleason score, four plus five or five plus four equals nine. So that's how you Gleason grade. If it was really that simple, it'd be really, really easy, because it isn't, but it's basically the principles. Um, I mean, Doctor Who is famous for saying, do you understand that? Good, because nothing like that, but that'll do for the time being. Um, and that's basically what it is. It actually, remember, everything is variations from normal. If you look at the curve, is it down the good end, close to what it used to be, or is it a lot different from what it used to be? And that's how you can understand cancer. So I hope that hasn't been too painful and too unpleasant. Um, and as I say, I'm here to help um, and I'm happy to take any questions um, now or later. And I hope you've earned a little bit of pathology tonight. Thank you very much. Very well done. <laughs> Thanks very much, Warwick. First question. Up the back there. Thanks, Craig. Um, just a couple of questions. First, uh, uh, firstly, is when you do a core needle biopsy, um, what's the chances of spreading the cancer very neurally or through the blood uh, vessel? Do you want to answer that first? Yeah, um, it's actually very, very zero, um, close to zero. Uh, in all organ systems, whenever you stick a needle into them, there is a chance of things spreading along. Um, and in other organ systems, uh, you often see displaced uh, tumor cells where there's been a needle biopsy. Uh, it depends upon the size of the needle. If you use a really, really big needle, then it does create a space. Prostates, for some reason, it happens very, very rarely, if at all. And it's something to do with the fibromuscular stroma that just closes down really quickly once the needle biopsy is cut out. So in the thousands and thousands that we've seen, I've not seen a significant example of it. I don't think it happens significantly at all with the, with the small needles that they're using these days. Okay. And the second question is, how much is it reliable or, uh, or how, does it, how much does it rely on the pathologist, you know, uh, from one hospital to another or from one pathology to another? Good yes. Yeah. Um, that's not a question of a good one or a bad one. It's a question of uh, there is always expertise to be gained by doing something over and over and again. Um, and that's why you go to a urology surgeon to have an operation on your prostate rather than a colon surgeon or a lung surgeon um, because the prostate surgeon's used to operating and that sort of stuff. Um, one of the things that the needle biopsy gave us was volume of, our, of information and it gave us volumes of tissue. And once we started to get that amount of material, we're able to start specializing. So we're able to spend a lot of time just looking at those sorts of things. So you will always have some people who do lots of prostate biopsies and some people who only do it occasionally. And the person who does it lots of time will be able to diagnose some cancers much more confidently than somebody who only just sees a few biopsies. So if there's any, any confusion over a particular biopsy, uh, and don't forget, all pathology is interpretation, right? It's all my eyeballs looking down a microscope and me interpreting what I'm seeing at. So it's, it's a scientific art or an artistic science, but it's not a science science purely. There, is, there are rules, but there is some interpretation based upon it. So the rules are the same as in clinical medicine. If you see a surgeon and you want to be a little bit confused, you go and see another surgeon. If you have pathology taken, you can get it reviewed by another pathologist and who's perhaps more expert in that sort of area. Um, and I do spend a lot of my time doing that and reviewing materials. Um, it's just common sense that if you really want to be sure, you want to make sure there's no mistakes, you can get a second opinion. Um, but in like everything else in life, the more you do one particular thing, the better you are at it, by definition, yeah. And as I say, it's not quite as simple as uh, I hoped I tried to make it to you. It's, it's exactly like that and nothing like it at all. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Warwick, a, another couple of questions for you. Uh, in all the examples you showed there, all of the Gleason scores were either the same or they were just next to each other, so three and a four. Can you have uh, two and a five, for instance? And secondly, can the cancer itself change? So what, if you did a biopsy today and you get it three plus three, if you did the biopsy on the same prostate in, say, three years' time, would it be a three plus four mm. or...? Yeah, you can have big differences in numbers, but as a rule, uh, and part of the modified Gleason is to refer to things such as the index cancer, and that we know that the ones and twos really don't cause any significant disease process um, going on with over significant periods of time. Um, so we tend to delete those from the numbers. So part of the Gleason modification is it really only goes from six to ten these days. Um, it's not tried true, it goes from five to ten. Um, because when we recognise grade ones and grade twos, we don't include them in the score because we know they are not matter. And it's the threes, fours and fives that are actually going to make a difference. Um, three plus five equals eight is a common process that we see. Um, because if you see a little bit of grade five, it usually means it's actually there's a tumour out there that's doing things that it shouldn't be. And that's a flag for this tumour is actually going to behave badly. Um, so we tend to include those really high numbers if you get mainly grade 3 and then a little bit of grade 4 and then a little bit of grade 5, we'll call it 3 plus 5 equals 8. Um, over time, yes, tumours do change and they do evolve and older males tend to have higher Gleason score tumours than younger males in the aggressive cancers. There are some prostate cancers which are not aggressive and they sit there as two, uh, yeah, four, fives and they don't do anything over a period of time and you see those more in, in very older people. Um, there are some cancers that occur in young people that are very high grade tumours and they start off as a really, really high grade cancer. The majority of cancers, however, start off as a low grade cancer and will evolve over a period of time. And it's often quite slow and you can watch it and see how it changes and that's part of the rules, uh, part of the theory behind watchful waiting um, or active surveillance um, is that you can actually see if this cancer is just sitting there as a grade 3 and not doing much then you don't need to do anything yet but if it starts to evolve into a grade 4 then you know you need to tre actively treat this patient. So it seems to be part of the natural history of biology of prostate cancer that changes over time becomes more aggressive uh, and it's sort of true of all prostate, of all um, cancers not just prostate that over a period of time they do change and it relates to the molecular biology becoming more abnormal the longer the cancer's around. So there's more genetic abnormalities, more genetic mutations that occur in a cancer the longer it sits around and as the mutations become worse and compound on top of each other it gets further and further along that curve away from what was normal and so it becomes a much more aggressive tumour. So nearly every tumour over a period of time will become more aggressive but a lot of tumours start off nasty and go crazy right from the beginning. How many estimates do you do uh, per patient? I mean, if you've had 10, had the discomfort of 10 uh, needles, do you do one on every needle? Do you do a number on every needle sample? And are you averaging? Uh, I mean, all the ones you presented to us were obviously singles, but uh, what sort of averaging are you doing to get yeah. more reliability, more repeatability? Because the other thing I was wanting to ask is what sort of repeatability do you get? Well, you personally probably get quite good repeatability, but someone coming into it fairly early, if they do one every day of the week uh, and do the same sample every day of the week, what sort of repeatability are they getting on it? Yeah, I'll answer the first part first. The, um, the repeatability was something that used to be a huge problem, and everyone used to say in the old days that you couldn't Gleason grade something unless you actually worked with Donald Gleason. He taught you how to do it himself because it was a witchcraft. Um, we've actually gotten it worked out a lot better than in those times and we're able to train people very earlier on. Um, so the College of Pathologists particularly put a lot of effort in during the 90s to make sure that pathologists as a group were using standard criteria and are reporting things reasonably well. Um, there will always be times when I go back and look at things. And get back to your first part of the question because it's relevant. What we do is every little core that comes in a pot, so each patient may have 10 or 12 pots, each one of those cores goes on a glass slide and we look at it at different levels. And I always go back if I find cancer at level two or level three and I didn't see it at level one, and I go back and see was it level at one. And in about 10% of the time it was there usually as a tiny little focus that I didn't recognize. Um, but the reason we do layers into the tissue is to recognize it. So everybody has good days and bad days. Um, and uh, I used to work years ago with a pathologist who worked at, um, did a lot of skin pathology. 
And he always said that you never diagnosed a nasty melanocyte lesion after 4.30 on a Friday. It was a bad thing to do for a pathologist. Um, those rules don't apply anymore. We have to work a bit harder than that. Um, he was much more important about going home at the weekend. Um, the structure now is now much more worked out. So that each individual core, in other words, each individual pot gets its own Gleason score. And so I didn't actually show the copies of the reports, but they'll be numbered 1 to 10 or 1 to 15 or 20 or whatever. And each one will be adenocarcinoma Gleason score 3 plus 4 equals 7 present in one of those two cores for each specimen. And then at the end, there's a separate bit where we bring it all together. Because don't forget, what we're trying to do is take a sample of the whole prostate. So you'll give, uh, you, uh, you have a synoptic part at the end of it, which actually flags the, the main things from above. And that'll say, therefore, the average Gleason score, if I put all those together, is, however, 3 plus 4 equals 7, because some of them were 3 plus 3, some of them were 3 plus 4, and some of them were 4 plus 3. Overall, proportionally, the composite, or the average Gleason score, is 3 plus 4. And then there's another line that says the highest Gleason score, however, is 4 plus 4 equals 8. And that flags it to the clinician and says there is actually an area of nastiness. So we do both. We do individual reporting, and then we give them an average type of information to try and let them make a prediction of what's going on in the prostate. It's particularly important if they have needle biopsies on right and left, there's only cancer on the left and nothing on the right. You have to come out a long way to get around the cancer on the left-hand side, but you can actually come quite close to the prostate and preserve the nerves on the right-hand side because there's no cancer. So that's why you report all the different things. So they're actually they're generating a map in their heads of what they've got to look like, what they've got operated on. But yeah, it takes a while. Um, how, how much of the cancer has to escape uh, to the prostate to sort of go on to cause other problems? Is it a, mm. like, I well, that's a really cool question. If you can give me an answer, we'll, we'll both go back to Stockholm and get the prize. Um, because theoretically it's one cell. The, because cancer cells are growing and multiplying and one cell getting outside the system is enough to start off and growing. But a whole bunch of other factors kick in because the body's immune system is really good at recognizing tumor cells anywhere in the body. And most people are manufacturing tumor cells all the time while we're just sitting here and then the body recognizes it, immune system comes in, kills it, bangs, moves on. Um, and so a lot of cancer cells get out, but they get clobbered um, and therefore they don't spread. Um, once they've gotten out, you can also hit them now with radiotherapy. Um, you can hit them with hormones, you hit them with chemotherapy, and that pulls them back as well. So we don't really know what the critical amount of tissue is. Um, the other thing is, of course, don't forget that when I've got a piece of tissue, um, it's got an edge to it. And we sort of assume that that edge is what the patient's edge is, but it isn't really. There's actually a couple of millimeters between the edge of my tissue and what's still in the patient, where the surgeon has cut, where the surgeon has diathermy, where the surgeon has destroyed tissue as you're moving out. And so it is possible to get a positive margin on, a, on the specimen, but have no cancer left in the patient at all. You can have a very small margin. Um, and at the moment, we don't know how to be unequivocally about those sort of stuff. We know that positive margins in some parts of the prostate are not as significant as others. But if we say, oh, this is not really a real margin. But if I ever work out what the actual critical number of cells is, I'll be back here, I'll tell you, and then we'll go and get the prize. You got another question, John? Yeah. Yes, just one more, if I might. Um, there's an enormous amount of work going on about pattern recognition uh, in the sort of computer software field. Um, is there work going on to try and apply that sort of thing and, in a sense, automate uh, and put you out of a job a little bit? Not yet. <laughs> no, that's not yet I'm out of a job, but maybe. Yes, there's a lot of work going on in it. And pattern recognition in histopathology is really, really complicated. Um, it's actually quite easy if you take, all the, all the organ systems are made up of cells. And if you take the cells out, uh, like I showed you in some of the earlier variables, and you just look at the cells individually, then they're actually good criteria for working out whether it's a normal cell, whether it's a malignant cell. And the computers are actually quite good at that now. And cytology, which is the study of individual cells, as opposed to histopathology, which is the study of tissue fragments, cytology has gone down this direction in a huge pace. Uh, the most important area it's done it is in pap smears. Um, and a lot of pap smears now are screened by machines, and the machines are really, really good at picking out the abnormal cells, and then you present those normal cells to a human to interpret. The trouble with histopathology is it's a multi-layered 
thing. As I said, we, we actually look at things and we slice them up. So we're looking at initially one level and then we're looking at a second and a third level. We're creating a three-dimensional model. We're merging together the three-dimensional model. Then I'm rotating it in my head, trying to work it all out. At the same time, analyzing the shape of the cells and all that sort of stuff. The, the computers aren't quite that good yet. Um, thank goodness for that. Um, it's actually still quite complicated. Um, the answer is going to be molecular biology and the answer is going to be not so much in cell mapping but in, um, um, in ma magnetic resonance um, probably. And MRIs uh, are nowhere near there yet but they're on their way to becoming the way of analysing cancers and it's that sort of energy in cells and the molecular biology of cells which will replace a histopathologist rather than a, a machine that just looks at, at shape and, and colour and size. Those machines have been around since the 80s and yeah. they haven't, haven't taken over yet. In your experience, um, is there a higher incidence of uh, positive margins in the robotic versus the open prostatectomies? Uh, the, the difference depends upon the experience thing we talked about before. Um, and there's been a couple of papers now that have shown, particularly with surgeons who use robotics and do openness at the same time, and then they map their margin rate at the two different procedures, and there's a learning curve. Uh, it's just exactly the same as everybody else. If you've got a surgeon who has just started to use a robot, he will get positive margins. And he might not get positive margins if he's doing an open radical prostatectomy. But after he's been doing the radical for a while using the robot, his margin rate will come back down again. So it seems really that there's not that much difference in margin rate between open and radical prostatectomy. The difference is in whether it makes the patient get up and walk quicker, that sort of stuff, whether they have the robotics or the non-robotics. It's, I tend to stay out of the fight about robotics and non-robotics. It's a urologist thing and they can fight that amongst themselves. Um, however, it isn't a thing in, in evolution. Um, but it, it, like everything else, it comes down to expertise. You, know, you don't want to be the first operation that somebody's ever done on anything, whether it be a robot or not. Um, it's the old story. You do not ever get sick on the second week of January in any year because the new medical students are out and they're just becoming interns. And you find someone to ring, you know, don't get yourself sick in those first few weeks. Whereas by the time you get to April, they're usually pretty cool and know what they're doing, but not in January. Um, and it's the same, same as everything. It's all about skill and numbers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's all about getting the experience under the belt, doing the miles, catching the waves. Uh, just going back to several points you touched on, uh, in relation to the progression of cancers from one form to another uh, and the genetic diversity, how are we going with correlates between that progression, different types of cancers, different markers, um, MRI you've mentioned? How, yeah. How's that sort of progressing? Yeah, the MRI is a great way of looking in things. And MRI has been almost, CAT scan and, M and now MRI has been uh, responsible for the almost complete disappearance of autopsies, um, except in forensic situations, because they can find out all the information really, really well um, that you could beforehand. Um, it's not really that good yet at the really, really small scale type stuff, and so small areas of cancers are difficult to map out. Um, the molecular biology is the answer, and it's been the answer for a long time now, so much so that actually it probably might not be the answer because everyone's been saying it's the answer for a long time. There are certain cancers in the body where unequivocally molecular biology is really, really important. Uh, leukemias are the ones where it matters dramatically. Um, and in some types of lymphomas, the treatment of lymphomas has changed just completely based upon the fact that we recognize there are certain genetic markers on the types of some types of lymphomas. They made particular magic targets to hit those and B-cell CD20 lymphomas now can be reduced in bulk hugely dramatically than they could have been years and years ago. Um, breast cancer is going through a huge uh, interest in molecular biology at the moment and we're reclassifying breast cancers the way we used to do it to a molecular basis now. Uh, it's still early days but it's a long way down the track. Um, prostate cancer's got a long way to go yet because there hasn't been the background of research. We're catching up, we're catching up thanks to the work that's going on. Um, there's a lot of research going into it now uh, but for a long time prostate cancer didn't get the, the research that other things have gotten. One last question. I knew we had one. Is there any attempt being made to tie um, retrospectively PSA analysis with Gleason scores after the radical prostatectomies in an attempt to try and identify the more aggressive uh, prostate cancers? Because it seems that PSA doesn't give you any indication such as that. 
just on its own? No, the, the PSA gives you an indication over time of what your cancer is doing. The Gleason, but once it's removed, theoretically, you don't have any PSA if you had a radical prostatectomy. The Gleason score gives you a prediction of whether that tumour is going to recur um, and the likelihood of that recurrence. And if it does recur, the PSA is a way of monitoring that. So you're using the two different things to give you different amounts of information. Before an operation or in a general population or whatever, you can use the change of PSA to detect the likelihood of a cancer evolving and developing but it doesn't, you don't get any actual information about that cancer from the PSA, except for one very, very small proportion of areas, I'll come back to say. Whereas the Gleason score is giving you the biology prediction of what that cancer is doing. If it does recur, you use the PSA to map it. The one situation where the PSA is paradoxically interesting is in the cancers that are really, really deviated from normal. In other words, a really, really high grade, the Gleason score of 5 plus 5 equals 10, they're so bad, they don't make much PSA. And so in that situation, you can say that if the PSA is really, really low and yet the cancer is high grade in the prostate, then those two together fact to come together to give you a fact that this is a really bad prognostic cancer. That's about the only situation where the two overlap. The rest of the time, they're giving different information over the time frame of the patient's disease. Does that make sense? Yep. It basically summarises that PSA is a lousy indicator of aggressivity. Uh, no, PSA change over time is a good indicator of aggressivity, but a one, one PSA number is useless. So how often should you actually be sampling PSA then in an attempt to get this rate of change as an indicator? Yeah, again, that depends upon the individual and the time frame, whether they've got no cancer or whether they do have cancer, whether you're trying to map, whether you're trying to follow them as somebody who's got cancer, you're just doing some active surveillance or not. Um, it's a change over time that matters and a short period of change over time is a bad prognostic feature because cancers are all cancers are doubling time. So everything is doubling, 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 getting bigger and bigger as each cancer cell grows. Um, so you, the PSA in that situation as a number on itself doesn't matter, but as a series of numbers and the, the reports that you get with columns and the PSA changes in the different columns, that's what matters. So for Joe Public, is one PSA reading a year enough, or is it...? Uh... Um, depends upon who Joe Public is. See, there's a theory going, or there's some information going around now that if you do one PSA at 40, you can make a really good prediction of what's going to happen to that patient 20, 30 years down the track. Um, but if you've got other things going on, particularly if you've got a family history, which is really important in prostate cancer, um, and if you've got other immune abnormalities in the body, then you need to have your PSA mapped much, much more quickly. If also you st your first PSA is very high, then you should have your PSA measured at a much shorter interval than someone who's got a PSA that's very, very low. But in both of them, if it changes dramatically over time, then you need to match them. It's individual, it has to be individually. And why don't they use free PSA to actual PSA every time they take this test? In most cases, I've seen just the PSA number being given as, as an absolute, but then later on, when mm. it gets outside the normal range, they, 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 they read the free PSA as well as the... Yeah, because the, the both graphs I showed you, the normal PSA graph for benign and malignant condition, the two graphs overlap, and the same with free to total ratios, the two overlap. Um, and so a free to total just on its own isn't important, but it's important if you're looking at PSA changes over time and if the, the free to total ratio is changing as well. So it's, it's about monitoring a patient rather than just coming up with one number. But as a rule, a free to total ratio gives you a little bit more information and probably should be done on everybody who's having a second and third PSAs. Probably not a reason for doing it on the first one. There's a very good book we've got over in our resources, you should pick that up if you haven't seen it. Mm. It's the one by um, Associate Professor Philip Stricker. Um, have a look at that. That's got some answers in it. Mm. He goes on and on and on about PSA. He yeah. does. He knows what he's talking about. He does. So that's a very important book if you want to have a look at that. So I think um, we've got to get the good professor away at a reasonable time so he can get back to his family. Um, thanks very much, Warwick. It's another um, really good presentation. Very interesting, and you can see by the um, the quality of the questions, you have a very interested and 
educated audience. So right. I'd like you to help me thank Warwick again. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank, thank you for the invitation.